Jeg fikk ikke noe lyd i sånn, jeg var satt på den enda her. Så så fikk jeg lyd nå. Men det lurer jeg på meg den. Men du fikk ikke noe satt på den? Ja, jeg har satt på lyden så. Så høyt er den. Vi tror også bare... Vi skal sjekke den. meets the Millennium Development Goals, and he is currently the Special Advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on Innovating Finance for Development, with the rank of Under Secretary General. <coughs> Dr. Blasi has also been a leading politician in France, and has, among other things, served as a Minister of Health, Minister of Culture and Communication, Minister of Solidarity, Health and Family, and finally, as a Minister of Foreign Affairs in the cab Cabinet of uh, Dominique de Vrie In 1996, he was elected the President of Unit Aid. Unit Aid, the Global Health Initiative, established under the auspices of the United Nations. In, in 2006, by the governments of Brazil, Chile, France, Norway, and the United Kingdom. It provides funding to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria among the world's most vulnerable populations. And the most interesting thing, perhaps, about this initiative is that it is, is the way it is financed, which is through a so-called solidarity levy on airline tickets. Currently, Unit Aid has 29 member states. And so far, more than $2 billion have been raised through the uh, uh, airline uh, ticket levy. Today, Mr. Dost Blasi will discuss the progress made in the promotion of innovative financing mechanisms and how they can bring a positive contribution in mobilizing resources to reach the Millennium Development Goals. Last year in the United Nations, the current French president, Mr. Francois Hollande, said that su the success of unit aid has influenced France to push for a tax not just on airline tickets, but also uh, on financial tr uh, transactions. And this proposal, I think, is something we're going to hear more about in uh, today's presentation. 
which is entitled Solidarity Will Change Globalization and Maybe the World. This is a topic of great importance and of course of great interest to us here at NUPI as well. Development aid and development uh, studies in general has been a core research theme for NUPI over many decades, not least because of one of today's commentators, Mr. Olaf Stocke, who has done research on this here at NUPI since the 1960s. We also currently at the Institute have several other research project which are projects which are related to this topic, including the study of tax havens and the study of the uh, development of the pharmaceutical industry <coughs> in India. So we very much look forward to the presentation and to the subsequent debate. So the plan for this seminar is that first Dr. Dostmazi will talk for about 40-45 minutes. Then we have three commentators, uh, Olaf Stocke, Besden McNeil and Benedict Bull, who will speak for about 5-10 to ten min minutes each. And after that, for the remaining time of the seminar, which we have in total allocated one hour and a half, we will open for questions and comments from the audience. So, I would then like to get with Dr. Dost Blasi and uh, invite him to make his presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to invite me and uh, thank you everybody for coming this afternoon. I think that and Mr. Ambassador, French Ambassador, thank you as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that this presentation is a political presentation. I know that you are in campaign, in during an electoral campaign, and I think it's a, a big issue for uh, uh, the campaign. Uh, because I am sure that, uh, that national policy, national politics, is now to look up. We have to scale up our vision, uh, and particularly about the development uh, policy. So, as you know, 2.4 billion people live on less than two dollars a day. It's a fact. It's like that. Um, your prime minister is very involved in uh, uh, the discussion at the United Nations level. And uh, in uh, 2008, in the Lancet with uh, President of Tanzania and President of Rwanda, he said, one child dies every two seconds, a mother every minute. It is time to act. Yes, it is time to act. The problem is that so far, when the uh, head of state said um, it is time to act, uh, it is time to um, increase the ODA. So, if we want, we can greatly contribute to the fight against this terrible injustice. We can no longer just sit back and watch this tragedy. I think that there are two kinds of, uh, three kinds of globalization. The first one is the globalization of the economy. It is done by the businessmen, because the businessmen are global. The second one is the globalization of the communication. It's done because by businessmen as well, because businessmen are global. But the solidarity depends on the politician. But the politician are too local. I was a politician, I know very well. Uh, it is very hard to uh, be uh, a minister or a mayor or a MP or a head of state or a, a prime minister. It's very hard. You can go to New York, to the United Nations, you can do a lot of uh, speech, make a speech, but after that you come back very quickly because you have to fight for your position and for your ideas in the, uh, in the uh, country. So, unfortunately, 
we don't have yet the globalization of solidarity. We have to create globalization of solidarity. And uh, uh, Louis, uh, um, um, Lula, the former president of uh, uh, Brazil, said this phrase, this sentence, I think it's absolutely right. Uh, I think that the atomic bomb is not in Korea, North Korea, or uh, the danger is not in North Korea or in, uh, in uh, Iran. I think that it is the issue, the first issue of the 21st century. We will not emerge from this current crisis unless we really uh, purge these moral failings of globalization and unless we play them as a part of our social contract. So we have to organize a balance between economic globalization uh, and uh, globalization of solidarity. And fortunately, with the economic and financial crisis, we uh, saw that the development aid fell by 4% of the world in 2020. <coughs> And after 2% in 2011, the first time. So multilateral sub-Saharan Africa uh, fell by 8% in 2012. And for the African continent, it was about 10%. And bilateral India, India fell by 30. So if you see the decrease of ODA, it's essentially for low income countries. And nobody speaks about that. If you see this, it is a dream, you have to do that. But congratulations, no way because you are there. But here is the ODA, but if you see the ODA in developing in the low income countries, you can see that the poorest in the world uh, uh, suffer a lot from this decrease. The second message is that the coexistence of mobile internet in one hand. And on the other hand, this extreme poverty uh, can uh, bring feelings of humiliation and even war. That could be a source of conflict uh, in the 21st century. We have a seismic effect. It increases. Sorry. We have a seismic effect. An increase in needs, and particularly the cause extreme poverty and cause climate change. And the other hand, we have a decrease of ODA. This seismic effect between public resources and the need of financial freedom is, for me, one of the most important challenges during this 21st century. We must find new funding instruments. We have three possibilities. First, we can push the government to say we want to have more. But it is very difficult tonight to ask a Greek MP to increase the idea, or a French MP, or an Italian MP, or a Spanish MP or Portuguese, or the U.S. It's very difficult. Second thing is to ask emerging countries. When I see that China gives, I think, less than one million a year to the WHO, I, I think that we can ask China to give more. But unfortunately, uh, the emerging countries said, when we were poor, you forget us, and uh, now uh, needs uh, 
we want to continue to emerge, but we don't want to give more for international bodies. So we have a big problem with that. And we have to discuss the unionizations and all that. But it is the reality. So now we have as well to create innovative financing for capital. You know, the limits of ODA were highlighted during the UN conference of Monterey in 2002. Ever since, the international community has been debating about alternative ways to finance development. And we think that innovative financing mechanisms appear to be one of the most promising solutions now. They are now an essential response to these challenges. These mechanisms are based on a simple idea. Making the most of globalized goods to enable those who don't have access to them to have access to universal public goods. These financing are very interesting because they are predictable, sustainable, complementary to ODA and innovative by the multilateral management of mobilized resources. About 20 countries have already implemented innovative financing. And so far, more than 6 billion euros have been raised uh, for all the mechanisms. We have first the uh, taxes on globalized activities. Ethical TV, you spoke about that, you need that, the financial correction. You have as well the guarantee mechanisms, and particularly advanced market commitments. And Norway knows very well, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway, works on that, and to regulate that particularly. Um, so, it is a, a guarantee about volume and price towards manufacturers. You have EFIN, this guy, you have lotteries. I, I tried to have a lottery for development in France, but uh, uh, for the, the failure. <laughs> but uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Belgium, uh, Belgium, because it's good. You have market mechanisms, for example, in Germany, you have an allocation to develop the part of the revenues of the European carbon emission. You have the citizen contribution with the initiative of ONU. Uh, and after that, you have the debt to health. It's very interesting, for example, if you take the example of Indonesia and Germany. And Indonesia should pay 20 million dollars each year to Germany for the debt. <coughs> and Germany said, okay, you don't pay, but you are doing give this 20 million for your health system. <coughs> it's mechanism. So Monterey consensus. It was a revolution. Community, international community said, we recognize the value of exploring innovative sources of finance. <coughs> In Doha Declaration, we encourage the scaling up and the implementation of appropriate of innovative sources of finance development. The UNGR resolution as well, at the General Assembly in 2010, and Rio 20 in 2012. So we see, little by little, the movement of the international community recognizing the necessity to uh, create innovative financing for the world. The first type of innovative financing is the idea of a global solidarity contribution. What is it? Um, it consists of installing Installing a completely painless micro, micro, micro 
acts of solidarity or levying of solidarity on activities benefiting uh, the most from globalization. It's mobile, uh, financial transactions, internet, uh, tourism, who's playing, uh, you know. This type of financing can allow us to establish a globalized solidarity. It is not a humanitarian combat, it's a political combat. These activities are those that have benefited the most. So they are the ones which would lose the most to globalization backfire and protectionism rights. And paradoxically, this constitutes, for example, internet. When you see that internet, uh, Apple is about 600 billion dollars as a stock exchange in Wall Street. If you see Google, it's amazing. If you see Facebook or Twitter, but you have to know that these companies pay less than 2% of taxation. And uh, Renault, Peugeot, Fiat, Ford pay between 25, 30, 32% of taxation. But these new companies don't pay any taxation. It's very interesting to see this new world in which we are. It's not possible to continue with this wealth and this extreme poverty. It's not possible. So, a completely new idea <coughs> that will bring great progress in the future of the development for me, my point of view. For the first time, the tax, what is the requirement of a country, will not be collected or directly managed by the Minister of Finance, but in a supranational collective money. It is the best tool to create the globalized solidarity. Uh, the first example is unique. In 2006, uh, we, yes, we got uh, younger, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> after that as well. <laughs> um, and uh, with uh, Norway, Brazil, Chile, uh, the UK, and France, and behind uh, there was a little translation of Angola and uh, Sassoon Gesso was, who was uh, the president of the African Union at this time. We signed during the General Assembly of the UN, UNITA. In France, we passed the law in uh, July 2006. One euro for all domestic and European flights, four euros for international flights. Uh, Forty heads of state committed. Uh, 16 have done so, among Chile, South Korea, Cameroon, but as well Mali, Niger, Madagascar. It's very interesting to see that a man or a woman who can buy a plane ticket in Bamako can buy one euro more. Because, so, United is not only a north-south region, it is as well a south-south. All the people lost by plane. <coughs> Norway established a tax base not on the pay tickets, but on the of other institutions and other countries. And uh, we are going to sign this Emirates, for example, in uh, two, two months. Ago. It is absolutely innocuous to the traveler. In France, nobody knows that they pay mm. 100 euro. But unfortunately, probably, but you know, a, nobody knows. Uh, it is harmless for the state. If this harmless financing is done for a very large number of people, this will cost large sums, 2.5 in six years, but it's only 70% from uh, 70% of the level. And the mode of governance is uh, interesting for us because, uh, you know, UNITED is as well a new mode of governance. Why? I uh, I, I say that because you have the public side, the Prime Minister of Norway, the Prime Minister of the UK, you have the 
the president of Brazil, Chile, France, and the president of African Union, Prime Minister of South, South, South Korea. That's it. After that, you had Bill Gates Foundation. It's a private. After that, you have two votes for NGO, civil society. One for NGO and one for the communities of patients. And after that, you have UN Nations. So it's a new government. I think it's very important to begin to think about. I know that John Scott Moore uh, thinks about the new governance of the UN, but uh, I hope that we are going, you know, to invent a new government. The first chair of United was uh, uh, Sigrun Mogadal. Yes, for five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> but it's true. And, uh, <laughs> and thanks to her, I became the second president of the um, from the beginning, we decided to use this money for the MDG, MDG 6, uh, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, to be concrete. Uh, so, why UNITED works through markets? UNITED aims to promote healthy, dynamic market conditions whereby manufacturers have incentives invest and innovate, <laughs> while at the same time supply quality and products at affordable prices and in acceptable formations. Uh, we have two calls possible. First is market patterns. We identify and facilitate adoption and uptake new and or superior to the The example is malaria. Before, we had kidney. But now we have artemisine. The problem is kidney now is inefficient. And artemisine is very, very efficient. The problem is that two years ago, kidney was one dollar treatment, and artemisine was seven dollars. So, Every African come to the pharmacy or the small shop to ask kidney. So we gave subsidies to the shops, the private sector, to do the difference between kidney and artemisia. And little by little, artemisia is becoming the most important uh, expression drug uh, to combat malaria in Africa. And we decrease the price of malaria. Or the second thing is market character. For example, you don't have in Norway, in Western countries, you don't have any children with uh, infected by HIV. Because all the pregnant women who are infected by HIV are treated. And the newborn is not infected. So if I am CEO of a big pharmaceutical company, I am not going to develop the pediatric drugs. Because I have done I don't have, I don't have market, any market. But you forget that more than one thousand children per day are born with HIV. But they can pay. So we pay the development. Uh, we, do a, we did a tender in the WHO, in the United, and after that, we pay the development of the pediatric drugs with CIPLA, uh, which is an uh, uh, Indian uh, pharmaceutical company. So <coughs> our work is when we are see the public health problem is to see the market of products and the reasons of market of products. After that, we do an innovative market intervention. And after that, 
we uh, calculate the impact in the sustainable market. Uh, it is our work. And what is interesting with Unitel is that Unitel doesn't work for itself. Unitel works for Global Fund, for uh, any international group who work in the field of Global Health. We are in 94 in the three countries, uh, 49 in for HIV AIDS, 39 for malaria, and 72 for um, Yes, this example shows the consequence of uh, the pediatric anti in uh, a young uh, girl. And uh, uh, now, we can say that uh, 8 out of 10 children on therapy for HIV globally treated with United Foods. So we are proud to see that. Because before United, we don't have, the international community didn't have any pediatric works on the uh, AIDS. Um, the main results of UNITEF is the market interventions to dramatically, uh, you know, increase life-saving products for the children. For now, it's 450 uh, children of quality assurance of the children. 1.5 uh, million children tested for the children. Over 300 million of the best malaria treatments in this country, 8 million HIV tests for pregnant women, and 1 million pediatric killer treatments for children. So, we proved that innovative financing for development can work. And our work is to decrease the price of these tools. 80% price reduction on HIV medicines for children, 80% for treatments of malaria, uh, artemisin, for example, 40% for the rap new rapid test for TB, and 60% price reduction on second line for HIV medicines. We are not on the ground. The reason why nobody knows UNITA. We work through partners. And for example, all the Program of UNICEF. Uh, to treat the pregnant women in Africa, all these programs are financed by uh, UNICEF. But UNICEF is in the world. Um, all the children of the treaty are treated by Peter Foundation in the child. But all the risk programs are uh, financed by UNICEF. You are the World Health Organization, we will try to drop that program so we do not trust that. For Artemisine, um, we pay half the program of IMF, is an affordable medicine for malaria, through, <laughs> through uh, the uh, Global Fund, etc. So, uh, as you said for the production, UNITED is only a model. Now, what has been done with airline tickets, we want to do that with financial manager. It's a big step for the world. We can, you know, tax stocks or bonds or both for an exchange derivatives. Uh, I take one example. 0.05 percent will generate 400 billion worldwide. It's a dream, it's possible. But I say that it's nothing for nobody in the world. So in France, we convinced Nicolas Sarkozy and François Hollande to pass the law 
and it is the first country to enact the financial transaction tax. Uh, not exactly the first, but in the UK uh, until, uh, in the 1984 with uh, Margaret Thatcher for the National Energy the staff duty. Uh, it became effective the 1st of August 2020, dividing 0.2%. That's 0.05, it's 0.2%. Transaction tax on share purchases. And we convinced the new president for so long to give 10% of this taxation for development. And uh, it is the first time that a country accepts to give a part of the financial transaction tax for development. But <laughs> Because the government is socialist, I thought that it was possible to have 100% for poor, but unfortunately, it was Early in 2013, European finance ministers agreed to implement the financial transaction tax under the Finance Corporation. Austria, Belgium, Estonia, Germany, Greece, France, Italy, Portugal, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Spain have decided, already decided, to implement this financial transaction. Now the problem is the new battery. This battery is capital and crucial. We have to explain to public opinion that with this financial transaction tax we can change the world. Why? Because you are going to see that all the Western countries, that African countries as well, are going to implement the financial transaction tax. This country as well, I don't know when, but you are going to do as well. The problem is that all the Minister of Finance are going to say it is for our national budget. So it is a new historical opportunity to explain that a part, 10, 20, 30, 40, I don't know, percent of this new taxation, global taxation, can go to the poorest in the world. And as Anthony Lake, the current director general of UNICEF, said, the poor, you are poor in developing countries, but you are poor as well in developing countries. I think it's very important to, to think about it. Financial transaction tax is economically feasible and legally enforceable. FTT reduces market volatility and speculation, thereby reducing the risk of abrupt adjustments in crashes. The choice of FTT over other forms of taxation of the financial market reduces tax avoidance and evasion. Implementing FTT does not lead to capital flight or any significant negative impact on the domestic financial market. So, implementing FTT is administratively simple and cost efficient. So, in the US, it's very interesting to see that Congress members Pete Starks and Edison introduced legislation to create a currency transaction. It is the beginning of a new debate in the US as well. And uh, Al Gore, Bill Gates, Jeffrey Sachs, etc., etc., begin to support this idea. And I saw recently the president of the Budget Commission of the House of Representatives who is Republican, say yes, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting idea, but for the national budget. So now we have to convince from the public opinion that the FTT is as well for government. The history of UNITED proves that innovative financing, particularly a global solidarity contribution on top of ODA, are a vital tool in the fight against Linux, yes, but more against poverty, hunger, and climate change. It's not only for health. It's, uh, it's the reason why we um, just created UNIDUC, 
une éduc is the same but for education. Because education is a universal wide and a sustainable path to human and economic development. And yet millions of children and youth are deprived of this right, and the majority of them are girls, and you know that it is a problem of Africa. And based on the successful experience of UNITED, UNITED will raise funds from public and private innovative sources to address the educational needs of conflict affected people in countries. So we are going to help actors on the ground rebuild schools and education systems, training teachers and prepare children and youth to the duties of freedom, peace and reconciliation. So, UNITED is done with WHO, and UNIDUC is done with UNESCO. And the source of finance is going to be announced. The launching is going to be in New York, the 1st of September, uh, the first week of September, um, with uh, um, a social network, big social network like Facebook. And uh, the uh, responsible of this social network, private, absolutely private, it's not a uh, tax, it's not a levy, it's private, uh, accept to give 3% of the benefit to UNIDU. To conclude, uh, to, to finish, uh, I want to speak not about innovative funding, but about innovative spending. Northern companies and Northern scientists they brought the drugs. Northern institutions regulate and approve them for human use. Northern dominated threat rules affect who can access them. And at what price? And crucially, this will determine whether or not a competitive uh, market can develop. I think that we have, and particularly with you, a responsibility to make the global rules which we have created and continue to control work in the federalist society. Because the rules of the intellectual property of patents, a human being living in developing countries has to wait between 15 to 20 years before having access to the same drug one gets in Paris, Oslo, or New York. Like that. And we, it's normal for us, you know, that it's inevitable. So we have a big problem. We have had a big problem because I was Minister of Foreign Affairs at this time, but we signed WTO, the entire country of India in the beauty. But when India entered into the beauty, the problem is that 90% of generic drugs in Africa are made, are produced in India. And because the entry into WTO of India, India cannot continue to compete, to, uh, to, to continue to have generic like that. Uh, India has to wait, as uh, European countries or America uh, to wait between 15 to 20 years to do the same. So, we are going to have millions of net by net of generics. It's a big, big problem. So, the reason why this means that the newer and the safer treatments will be more expensive. And there is a risk that the budget of organization financing drugs like UNITED, like Global Fund, like Holbeck Malaria, like UNICEF, uh, will not stretch as far as it needs to in order to make the federal rights of demand in the future. For example, today we have 8 million AIDS patients under treatment. All the international commitment is to treat 15 by 2050. How? Personally, I don't know. <laughs> uh, how we can say that? The only solution is new world HIV medicine widely patented in developing countries. The only way. How? 
the reason why UNITED proposed in 2010 a groundbreaking initiative, the creation of a non-profit structure in which patent owners agree to license their patents to enable generic producers to manufacture generics against HIV AIDS exclusively for the low income countries and the low income countries. Therefore, the sick living in a poor country will have the same work at the same time as God living in developed countries. It's the first, if we succeed, it's the first time in the year for the humanity. So, the scheme is very easy to understand. <laughs> Here you have Jackso, uh, Pfizer, some of you don't know, but you have patent holders. We ask them not to give because the owner keeps the owner. Intellectual property is respected. The patent uh, is there. But by license, we negotiate uh, the medicine patent. One of the board members of the patent is second. Thank you very much for have accepted to be a part of the board. Um, we invite patent holders to negotiate. Um, after that, there is a license. We sign agreements. They sign agreements. And after that, you have free license. And you have the price very good. Only for uh, these uh, patients in developing countries. And the medicines patent pool received its first license from the biggest national institute of health in the world, is NIH, is from Academy for patents related to HIV medicine. It was the first. It's academic side. Easy. After that, the private side. The 10th of July, 2011, announcement of the first agreement between one major pharmaceutical company, Gilead, the biggest company in the, in the field of HIV AIDS from California, and the unit of medicine spectrum information. And the White House congratulates Medicine Patent Pool and Gilead Science in the website of the uh, uh, White House for breaking new ground in using voluntary licensing agreements as a tool to improve access to medicine for people with disabilities. 27 February 2013, we have a joint venture of Glexo, Pfizer, and Chinoli in VIV healthcare, collaborating between. Etc. Etc. Et so I think that we have opened a new way, not for funding, but you know, to avoid a lot of billion because you uh, avoid a lot of billion of dollars with that. And the unit of medicine patent pool has signed a license with Shazen Pharmaceuticals Gilead Science. That will allow Shazun to produce the active ingredients. The Shazun is for generics. So we have done the first, the first patients between uh, the generics and the populations. Uh, and uh, the new director as well, the former director, actually amazing work. And I'm for nothing in that. Uh, uh, so, it's uh, finished. Uh, my aim is to transform this, you know, terms global public goods in universal public goods. It's very different. Global, of course, the public goods are global. The problem is, are they universal or not? I think ending extreme poverty will mean addressing problems of fragile and conflict affected countries. Who are giving the money back to the rest of the world. Um, I think that these measures will seem technical, but 
they are not. They have always the major problems of the 21st century. Um, yes, it's my last. The virtuous circle. We can take economic profit on internet, financial transactions, planes, uh, uh, very big, uh, you know, a global economy, a, a global uh, activities, economic activities, which benefits benefit a lot from the globalization. After, we have Unitel, model, micro solidarity contributions. After that, we can give global public goods, food, drinking water, access to healthcare, education, sanitation, social benefit. Economic profit, social benefit. After that, a million of men and women forced to live in poverty will receive care, resulting in lower income mortality, resulting in we enter the market economy, across skills, university schools, transformation of their lives, increase of the GDP of their countries, and the GDP of France and the Euro and Norway and so on. So I think it is possible to do this new model in our okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we now proceed to the next step, which is the comments from the three commentators. And I suggest that the three of you sit up there. Um, and perhaps you can sit there as well. Um, and we take it uh, in this order. First, Benedict, then Desmond, and then Olaf. First of all, thank you very much for a very uh, interesting presentation and for inviting me as a commentator. Um, I will comment more on the book than the presentation since we were given uh, given that to have a look on a few weeks back. And uh, the presentation actually contains some very interesting um, pieces of information, including the virtual circle, which is not actually in the book. Although the title is the virtual circle, that would be, have been really helpful if it were in the book, and we could have taken uh, a closer look at that. Um, I think, in general, I mean, this is an impressive and interesting initiative, and uh, and something that uh, I think it's very hard not to be sympathetic towards. It, innovative, it is, as uh, it said, it's uh, quite simple solutions that can have a great impact in terms of financing. We've discussed a lot the Tobin tax uh, in different kind of groups here in Norway, and uh, the air levy uh, is equally interesting, and it's also mentioned some other possibilities for, for increasing uh, funding for the multilateral system in an innovative and rather unconflicting way, at least if it's you can convince uh, other policymakers to actually implement it. Um, and um, of course, it's, in, it's impressive when you read it because it's a person that has written it that knows uh, all, the, uh, all the details and also all the obstacles towards and all the political problems. As he said, this is not a humanitarian event, it's basically a political, and I totally agree with you on that. However, I have very short time, so I'm just going to go straight on to the more critical points that I have with both. And I think the main point is that I think it's a bit of an oversell to say that um, the title of the book is Solidarity Will Save Globalization. I think um, it should have been called, a very, of course nobody would buy a book with this title, is How Can We Reach Important Social Goals, or the MDGs, uh, by benefiting from globalization and without tearing down capitalism. Because I think that is what it's about. It's about reaching some important social goals in a very efficient and innovative manner. But I think to talk about transforming uh, capitalism and um, to emphasize so much the world solidarity 
can be a little bit over oversell. And I'm going to try to ex explain why I think that. Um, I think, first of all, I was a bit puzzled that the word solidarity, that means a lot to, I, I think, a few of us have a very clear definition, but at least it's a big word. It's about sort of something about our inclination. It can also be institutionalized solidarity that we're quite used to here in Norway. I think it's a bit odd for us to talk about local solidarity because we think that our social system, it's not, it's based on solidarity, but it's institutionalized. It's not something that we think about every day. But then I find that um, there's no definition on solidarity. There's the start one, but then it says our definition of solidarity, a global solidarity rooted in innovative financing. So innovative financing is basically solidarity, and that is what's going to give <coughs> capitalism, basically. And I think, um, I think it might have a very important impact. I'm a little, bit, a little bit more in doubt whether it will save capitalism. In these success, like we have outlined all the factors needed to create to create a virtual circle, and then pointing to uh, global solidarity contributions and social businesses, which is not very much elaborated on. But that was very highlighted in this virtual circle that I saw here. Um, and I think that uh, I, I, I hope, and I think that, solid, uh, that capitalism can be uh, saved from itself, or it can be at least moderated to give it more of a human place. But, and if you look around the world, you find different capitalisms. You find connected, but cap different capitalist systems that have different uh, impacts. And um, some have a more social place. Uh, our Scandinavian, Scandinavian model of capitalism has, uh, it's quite differently regulated and has quite different impacts than other kinds of, of, of capitalism. And um, I think it's very difficult to really talk about uh, um, transforming capitalism without looking at in the institutions that have that regulate capitalism in different contexts and how they complement each other. And I think that's quite beyond uh, just a, a new form, a form of financing of some very, very important goals but nevertheless not, uh, not the whole system. And I also think that changing such a system historically has not been pain free. I, I, I really doubt whether it can be a, a kind of an easy and pain free process now. But that might not be the real purpose of, of, uh, of your presentation of your book either. Uh, I think, uh, but it's basically about that. It is a little bit of an oversell. And, and, and related to that is my second point, and that is that uh, the book pervades, in a way, a little bit of a confused and contradictory view of the role of the state in, in saving capitalism or in reaching important social goals. There are a lot of codes that, that kind of points us to uh, a view of the state as inherently untransparent and, and inefficient. And that is definitely the case for a lot of states around the world. And there's also an emphasis on the fact that Unity never gives funds to government. It works through other organizations that it says, quote, uh, have the competence and ultimate responsibility to provide treatment to those in need on the ground. I don't doubt that, but I, uh, at the same time, it says that only states can collectively agree to solidarity contrib contributions and fund global public goods to these, um, so that these become uh, a reality for all. And that leaves me with a question, what is exactly the responsibility of the states related to different non-profit organizations, NGO, private foundations, etc.? And, and perhaps more importantly, if the ideal, is, the ideal is to channel the funds away from the states, how are they ever going to build the capacity to, make, to exactly take the responsibility that they should have? And I think this big kind of contradictory view on the state also, uh, also uh, goes for the view on the UN system, because it says on the one hand that both states are sitting on their thrones along uh, in official rooms while representatives of civil society remain on the streets. The path seems to be blocked. Unquote. And that might be true for some parts of the multilateral system, but it also show how, how uh, UN is, uh, the UN is changing in many different ways, and not the least in the unity. So I think that um, uh, it's on the one hand, it is a big kind of contradictory view on the UN, but also shows a little bit of a lack of respect for all the processes that have been going on over the last 10, 15 years to exactly include different civil society organizations in the UN in different ways. That raises a number of different issues 
from organizational issues to legitimate issues, legitimacy issues. But at least these are issues that should be treated and, and discussed and not just kind of uh, um, uh, writing off the UN system as something that is run entirely by the states that are sitting on their thrones. Um, I a very uh, brief final point that I'm not going to elaborate a lot on, and that is that um, I think um, the book, not your presentation, but the book has a bit of a tendency to glorify the past of capitalism. There is a lot about the, how capitalism has become global, has become brutal, um, and, uh, and has become non-solidary. Uh, I think, um, especially I quote like, Capitalism has always been a driving force of social equity. It's something that uh, is difficult to accept as that because uh, even 50, 100 years ago, capitalism was uh, was quite brutal uh, for most of the people in the world. Maybe not in uh, maybe sadly some of the rich countries that have experienced uh, a even more a kind of new brutalization, but capitalism has always been brutal for the the front of the of the global population. And I think that um, at least for analytical clarity, I would have wanted a, a more of a thorough discussion of what capitalism really means and what it has been. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, I forgot to introduce you, but this was Benedicte Bull from the Center of Study of Environment and Development in Oslo, who is a political scientist and an expert on polit political development in Latin America. Uh, the next commentator is Desmond McNeil, an economist from the same institution, specializing on multilateral institutions and development. Is that pretty good, sir? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So please, Desmond. Um, again, also uh, thank you very much for inviting me and congratulations on the point on your work. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I, I mean I entirely agree with your plea for solidarity on a global scale. I think it's time we extended our sense of shared citizenship and mutual responsibility from the national to the global scale. I always fully support your proposals and tax measures that will provide revenues to make this solidarity have real material significance. And I commend your efforts and those of the government of France to turn these proposals into reality, and most notably the very substantial achievements of Unidec. But as a researcher who's been invited to make critical comment, I'll use most of my few minutes to discuss rather reluctantly what I see as some weaknesses in the argument. More specifically, I have problems with your characterization of capitalism and the market, which seems to be not entirely coherent. And I also have some problems with the questioning assumption that the funds that are generated, or at least some of them, should be channeled through foundations such as Bill Clinton Foundation or NGOs such as Oxford. I'll elaborate my arguments by reference to a few quotations from the book, so I won't, I won't read them all out completely, but is there a way I can show when I want to click through them? So the question is first on capitalism and the market. Is is capitalism the solution or is it a problem? This is the capitalism. And the, the punchline there, it has inherently a driving force for human development, is the punchline. Which sounds like it's a positive force. You also write that we need to rebuild capitalism, um, suggesting that capitalism is, is the problem. And so it's the contradiction between these two, which we front also through other parts of, of the publication, and raises the question, why is it necessary to rebuild capitalism? What exactly is wrong with it? I feel that's never quite clear. What exactly is the diagnosis of, of, of capitalism, if it is indeed the problem? It seems from much of the publication that rebuilding capitalism is the main task of the application. Picture a reformed capitalist system. Or, and then again, we cannot accept the idea of a society bound entirely to the powers of a market that refuses to benefit as many people as possible. So here it's capitalism and market is, is the problem. This is what has to be reformed. So in, in, in brief, to me it's unclear what exactly is your conception of the capitalism and the market. 
And this matters for the argument, I think, because the question is, is the proposal a, an innocuous tinkering at the margin, or is it for reform and rebuilding the system, which is a very ambitious, very different sort of aim. Now, related to this are what seem to be ambivalent views about the provision of public goods. Which public goods, by definition, are those which should make up for the limitations of the market? So, you say this quotation I could read in, in full of time. But to me, there are a number of questions arise from this quotation. One is, first, well, firstly, the funds would clearly not be unlimited. And I don't think this should be considered humanitarian aid, but rather providing a bare minimum level of social security to everybody in the world. The cycle of poverty argument, which is used here, which has been used against national social security programs, is surely rather difficult to apply when this is a question of the rich paying for basic primary education. And what is the difference between improving access to global public goods, such as primary education, and providing welfare. It's not clear to me. But let me move on to my second point, which is about legitimacy. Um, my second comment relates to how the funds that are generated by the proposed tax are to be used. I'm concerned about the democratic legitimacy of institutions such as the Clinton Foundation and Oxford. I don't doubt that they do excellent work, and I know well that UN agencies often fall very far short of their ideals. But surely we have to recognize that some, and especially people in the South, will question the political legitimacy of NGOs and foundations. This, I, I won't really doubt that this is the quote uh, justifying the, uh, the use of these institutes. And it, it's clear from, from the publication that you're very skeptical of global governance. Uh, the you say global governance is not a Trojan horse for a future global government. The form that such a state would take is too easy to predict. No one wants to live under a form of governance so tainted with violence and humiliation. This is a very, very negative picture of any sort of uh, global government. And then again, Globalization would not rest on the shoulders of political leaders, but on those mere administrators working as public servants or private managers. And it's not merely a collection of international institutions, forums for the elite and selective groups of experts and converts. It isn't the Clinton Foundation a forum for the elite and selective groups of experts and converts. I, I, it seems to me you're, you're rather uneven in your criticism. Here, as you'd like to note, that there are always rules and decisions that are enforced by an authority. So the question is, what is the legitimacy of this authority? And I quite agree with this quotation, but surely the argument applies also to foundations and to NGO. It also almost seems that you agree uh, in places, because you, you seem to be ambivalent also about NGOs. Um, but here you say NGOs respond to donors, not to society. And what you say here also is political actors are the only ones who truly represent the people, which seems again to be inconsistent with your argument. And although you are very critical of the UN, you also appear to suggest that it has legitimacy. Of this list, of all these different lists of uh, organizations, it's only the UN is political, that is to say representative. I just mean that an ambivalence, a, a, a something about incoherence in your attitude to the different authorities and, and toward the UN. So it seems to me that it seems to me that whatever their very substantial merits, and they are very substantial, the foundations and the NGOs through which you propose to channel at least much of the funds that are generated lack the formal legitimacy of the UN agencies such as UNICEF. And that for me is a problem. So to conclude, I think this is a very good initiative. It deserves our support. The moral case for a global solidarity tax is extremely strong. But it doesn't require rebuilding or remodeling capitalism. It involves only tinkering with it. And for gaining political support, I think that's probably an advantage. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Desmond. Um, we now have one final commentator, which is Olaf Stokke. The grand old man, if I might say so, of Norwegian development studies and research on 
development aid at Newby and in Norway. Okay. I think we should just test the out. Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate you with the achievement of the so far. And um, for the, the enthusiasm and compassion presented to your case. Um, financing uh, a humanitarian development through a new and innovative mechanism that of a degree of tax on air tickets could be provided by travelers. Uh, the government of France uh, has been in the driving seat in its um, uh, in realizing this idea. The idea is not new as an idea. The ideas are important. They may be forerunners of, um, of action. The ideas rest, however, on uh, the willingness, determination, and ability of political actors, governments, and individuals to put uh, them into reality. France, in this case, has demonstrated this result and ability in the case of uh, Umitate. Uh, uh, the um, idea of financing activities through levies on air tickets and uh, CO2 uh, emissions. The establishment of Unitaid may represent a new beginning by setting a, an example extending to other areas. The efforts uh, recently to revitalize the turbine tax uh, may be the best example. That tax was proposed in 78 by James Tobin, professor at UA and advisor to the US government. It had not development as the prime objective, but just to get control of the finance, financial transactions. Uh, by putting a uh, levy on, on financial trans flows between, between the, the countries. Let me take you back to ideas developed long ago, 40 years ago, along with uh, the turbo tax uh, that were not realized. Ideas that went beyond ODA by uh, governments with uh, the O point seven percent target as the guiding in, in, in the early 80s, the Joint Development Committee of the World Bank and the IMF set up a task force uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of ODA, commissioning a series of, of um, studies that resulted in a volume by Robert Carson and associate on just eight work in sixty published in eighty-six. Some of the so-called like-minded countries insisted that not only the effectiveness of aid should be explored, but also the possibility to increase aid. This resulted in a new task force on concessional growth, chaired by Professor John P. Lewis previously the chair of that. The task force was invited to look into the possibilities of increasing ODA through efforts to meeting the 0.7 target. Uh, but also uh, other mechanisms such as um, automatic funding. Uh, they also should look into uh, non budgetary funding, such as um, direct taxation, for example, on the uh, income spawned from the uh, use of international funds, such as uh, ocean resources, the atmosphere, the uh, electromagnetic frequency spectrum, outer space, etc. etc. And indirect uh, taxation. 
on, for example, international trade, energy and uh, minerals, arms, export goods, or arms trade, international air travels, the, 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 the source you have uh, <coughs> looked at, and trade transport, specifically durable reductive factors, etc., etc. The Nordic, who had uh, pressed for the appointment of this task force, uh, were um, uh, represented uh, by the Finnish uh, ambassador and state secretary, Frankenstein. Uh, they decided to, to set up a Nordic Dutch working group to assist in exploring these new sources for development, uh, commission studies to that end. The speeds were very active in this at that time. The report concentrated on ODA growth and health and uh, related to the uh, ODA GNP targets and on the offers on, on the NGOs to provide additional resources. So not very much in practice came out of it. However, ideas were there to be picked up. As stated, ideas may be important for uh, action. But they need to be picked up by political actors with imagination, determination, and ability to carry them out. Perhaps Unitate may represent a new beginning. Let us hope. We will see, we, we have to see. Let me take a glimpse. I distributed a, a, a little note back from now. Uh, just to see if you uh, have a little glimpse of the, um, the um, uh, handing of the uh, unit uh, through the first six years and with particular reference to uh, the last one. As you see, um, it is very much um, uh, French and European uh, class. The tax Leverage on, on air travels and uh, 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 this is an important part of it, but not the crude part. Uh, quite a lot has been financed by ordinary development assistance. Uh, uh, for instance, the contribution by the United Kingdom in second draft uh, contribution. To the so it is a combination of all, all, all these resources. <coughs> And, and you see also that the trend is not going upwards in that way. You, you started by, by relating to the election, election campaigns which are going on. Development assistance in general has not been part of that discussion so far, and we are not only at the beginning of the process. Uh, hopefully, if we uh, get further into thanks to an initiative of this institute to put a focus on the foreign policy. But it is an indication that uh, countries are becoming more and more inward -looking. concerned with their own problems and uh, how to finance. Uh, and, and the financial the financial crisis has been a on this another thing which, which we see is that um, that the focus the focus of the of the foundation is is uh, on, on improvement of health to the majority of campus, and campaigns against uh, major diseases and so on. Not on general improvement issues, social and economic uh, And France was a pioneer in, in the early years, uh, just on how the concern uh, was on, on economic growth. Uh, by putting in social development as a part. So, so it's holding up a, a, a tradition. Let us also take a look at the um, 
uh, trends in the early uh, performance of funds as compared to the international with, 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 uh, with the international. And what, what is striking is that um, France was a very big, the largest contributor of OBA in the early years. Uh, but you see, they are continuing. Um, uh, have a on, on, on the, what is implied in the OBA transfer OBA. But you see, they are continuing. And what is also interesting is that uh, it's a share of 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 multilateral aid is uh, is going up. So so that, that is also part of the general line which uh, is is uh, provided in your presentation. Yeah, I did not go into uh, the philosophical arguments <laughs> that and, and I think we, I agree very much with many of the points uh, uh, that have been raised in the uh, I think we have some problem, problem with this uh, with the conditions and then the interpretation of the development assistance contributions are studied. Okay, then, then the, the paradigm of uh, realism is, is adopted. And, and uh, I think uh, for most of the, the uh, faith providers, particularly the Soviet Court, have to be covered. Uh, this is true. But there are the alternative paradigms uh, now to, for instance, the burden of the but what we see, even in the debate on how we make a policy is that there is a real further as a people in the public. So you have a trust. Um, Thank you to all three of you. We are running a little bit short of time, and uh, I suggest that what we do, and some very big and difficult issues have been raised, um, so I suggest that we first let the respond briefly to <coughs> some of the questions and comments that have been raised, and then we may have time for a couple of comments or questions from the audience as well, but unfortunately not too many. So you may start to, to, to respond. Do you want, do you want to, to, to respond to some of the comments? Yes, Mr. <laughs> uh, no, I think that uh, we agree about the political side of the book and uh, not on the humanitarian side. Um, but for me, and it is the reason why I, I want to uh, answer first to uh, uh, I made I made a very big difference between the, I am not an economist, so excuse me. But uh, I am a politician. I was a politician. I did a very big difference between the social capitalism and the financial. I think that when you are, uh, of course in uh, an, uh, for example, Renault. Renault. When Louis Renault went to Boulogne near Paris in uh, the 20s, uh, he's going to do a lot of factories with uh, thousands and thousands of workers, and after that, a lot of, uh, of uh, wages, salaries, taxation, and we did schools, highway, hospital, we had. So there is a lot of. And each two years, or each three years, we have a big combat between trade unions on one side and the boss on the other side. And little by little, there is a life in the company. Uh, it was a social capital. 
Now, the trading are less simple. And the director, and the CEO, is less simple. What is very important now in the capital? Somebody at 10,000 kilometers from the factory, pension fund, uh, is retired in California or in Canada. The factory is in France. He doesn't know that. And the second person who is very important is the consumer. So I think that little by little we have to, uh, I am afraid that the only uh, person who is important now is the retired person in, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, he waits. Our person that is doing work uh, in back in uh, is invest invest. So I think that we have to. I know that the capitalism was very brutal at the beginning of the century, in the 20th century. I know that, but I see as well that the lot of middle class coming in the, uh, was coming now. I am afraid to see a lot of young people in the city, in Wall Street, who earn a lot of money with this uh, with speculation. And, uh, and all the speculation, all, all the speculation on uh, uh, this capitalism now, not all, but uh, more and more, and I think that it's, it's a problem. Probably, uh, I want this book. It's too much for me. Uh, and for example, I don't want to rebuild the capitalism. Uh, I am uh, humble, and I have absolutely impossible for me to the mistake why we uh, uh, rebuild. But I think that we have to change little by little, and we have to, um, to come back to a social capitalism first. <coughs> Um, second thing, I do a big difference between the aid to provide global public and the welfare to give aid for economic development. For me, it's very really different. When you have nothing in the pockets, uh, and uh, um, for example, to uh, answer your question also. Um, the capitalism today, when you are a child in Addis Ababa and you have HIV AIDS, the capitalism now, the pharmaceutical company, cannot develop drug for this child. Why do you want that the CEO of this company is going to develop this drug? Because there is no market, the parents, the family, the state of this child cannot pay. It's a capitalism, you know. Your capitalism, my capitalism, the capitalism in the planet. So I think that we have to regulate for global public goods. It's the same for food, it's the same for drinking water, it's the same for um, uh, sanitation. Two billion people are without sanitation. And I think that we have to give money for that. Um, about NGO, I think that NGOs are not sufficiently heard uh, in the UN system. I know that NGOs is. Uh, are in the UN system, but not uh, sufficient for me. About the legitimacy. We don't give, I, 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 as president and chair of UNITED, I never decide myself to give money to Freedom Foundation. Never. I never want to give myself money to Oxfam. <coughs> It is the 
gouvernement of Norway, the government of France, the government of Chile, Brazil, etc., etc., and as well, when the gates that will decide to be this war. Uh, it is, uh, if we, you know, we have uh, 15 or 16 experts who work, um, and with two or three meetings per, per year, who um, work on hundreds of proposals, and they accept to be two, three, or four financement or program financing or programs each year. If it is a human condition which is the best, we give. If it is a global fund, we give. If it is UNICEF, we give. But uh, it's not you know, but it is a public sector, uh, it's, it's governments which is as a majority as the board of the which is in charge of that uh, decision. Um, and uh, about uh, uh, yes, I think that it's a new beginning. Uh, the problem is no, about the fund of uh, funding of the Thirty percent, seventy percent come from the uh, index, and thirty percent. Um, we are going to have any rates. Uh, and as you know, any rates airways is a very good company. And uh, we are going to sign any rates in your in your months. Um, and um, I think that among the different sources of financing we used you spoke about threat transfer. I think that is a big, big, big idea. Uh, because with the globalization, all of our uh, you know, um, uh, uh, shirts or pants or uh, you know anything come um, between countries through the world. And I think the threat, maritime threat, uh, is probably one uh, very big source of innovative financing. If we take zero point zero 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 ten percent back up. Okay, we're running out of time. I have three people who have asked for uh, to have some comments, so I think we'll do that very briefly. So please be brief, all of you. First, uh, Bill Scorsen. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, it's always uh, fascinating to listen to Philippe Tosso uh, I have uh, had the privilege of coming to Paris, to our embassy in Paris, when he was still the Minister of, uh, of Foreign Affairs of France. And we're in Norway, uh, and after 2005 elections in Norway, switched its policy uh, on uh, innovative financing so that we could join the process uh, and then become a partner with France in the whole process that was started under. Philip's uh, leadership in uh, 2006. Uh, I think uh, his personal role has been important. He is a man of vision, but he is also a man of action. Uh, and I, I think he uses all his uh, enormous uh, network, uh, knowledge of political leaders, and leaders uh, in academia and in the private sector, has been a driving force of moving the process forward. It's not been an easy process, and there have been uh, as there has been considerable progress in unity. There are other examples of, of uh, issues that have been brought into the process. For instance, now the efforts against uh, tax havens, Norway was instrumental in supporting that process. But there have been some uh, <coughs> some mountains to climb. Uh, uh, just to mention of uh, two or three arguments against uh, well, that have been used against. Firstly, and I think this uh, we also heard uh, in Norway that this would take away the pressure on governments to increase their ODA commitments. I think that argument has lost its relevance and, and lose because of the declining ODA and because of uh, the very fact that global needs now far exceed what can be provided or funded by ODA. So I think that argument uh, is no longer valid. 
there has been an almost ideological argument from uh, political circles who do not like taxes, where the corporate is strong on reducing taxes and not uh, adding new taxes. It's still a debate, uh, and we have it in electoral campaigns all over the world. And 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 thirdly, I think must look at I must look at uh, look it up. The uh, The ministers of finance uh, all over the world, they do not like earmark taxes. And this uh, is also a battle we have to fight in our own country, where we have a strong and very strong minister of, of, of finance, uh, which do not like any kind of earmarking of taxes and therefore have been skeptical of moving along uh, these directions. I think if we look back at it uh, from where uh, the process started in, at the Monterey Conference in 2002 and from the 2006 start of the leading group on energy financing, the progress has been important and impressive. And I think uh, those who say that this should also be an element in our own electoral campaign, uh, they are right. Uh, so far it hasn't been. It has been mentioned by uh, some, but, uh, but it's certainly not been, uh, been, been an issue. I certainly hope that our position will survive the elections and that we will continue to be a partner with France and Philippe and uh, the other countries who have got this process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, you. <laughs> Please be brief. Yes, hello, my name is Christine Ordal. I work for the Norwegian Knowledge Center. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm curious though about the evidence behind the financial transaction tax because Sweden had a tax like this about 20 years ago. It failed because the financial, most of the corporate taxes left the country and it was left to the Swedish individuals to pay the tax. So I think financial transaction tax is an interesting idea. It's done universally, but the fact that the US and the UK don't want to come into it may make things a bit difficult. But my, my question is about global public goods. Unidate, I'm a big fan of it. It's good to bring down the prices of branded pharmaceuticals. However, most pharmaceuticals on the WHO's essential medicine list are generic. They're cheap. There's lots of competition. But what these countries need the most, most is they need uh, health systems that work. Now, how are we going, what is the proposal to actually build up these health systems? Because they're not global, healthcare is a global public good. But functioning health systems is a national public good. Thank you. Finally, Ulf Sato. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for a nice uh, presentation. Uh, I'll leave the philosophical side out of it. As I said, it is, uh, you address basically three big issues. The first is on the innovation of the financial aspect and the and uh, the kind of increase of the tax base. You don't that convincing me. Uh, and then the third is the innovation on how to spend it. But uh, the third point, now the second point is uh, kind of convincing the ministries of finance to allocate this tax base, this newly found tax base to international solidarity. Um, is there some kind of limit to your success here? In the sense that the more successful you will become, the more eager the minister of finance will be to get get their hands on this, this problem. So there's limits to how big you can be. <coughs> Thank you. Now, to round off this seminar, I will give you the chance to some final comments and respond to the last three questions. Thank you. So, um, this first, um, um, UK has voted, already voted, um, a financial policy tax. In 1984, Margaret Thatcher did. 0.5% the duty stamp, top duty, but for the national budget. And each year, Mr. Osborne, the Minister of Finance, received between four to five billion pounds a year from the stamp duty. The reason why I convinced Nicolas Sarkozy to do the same, 
with 0 0.1 and also long multiplied by 2, to have 0 0.2. So it's possible. I know that now the UK said we don't want to have a new one soon, but uh, we have now 12 European countries. So I am going to come back to you as a that. Yes, it's true. And the problem is that if we convince, if we, if we convince all the other state or the Minister of Finance to do the financial financial price, the money is going to go to the national budget and not to the government. So we have to find, uh, I don't know, advertising or publicity in the world, if you want idea. You know, to, to, to have this um, uh, electroshock, uh, electroshock, yes, <laughs> electroshock, you know, uh, to say, wow, it's possible. Because I am sure that if the public opinion knows that it's possible, after that, I agree with you, we have to, 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 to organize a good governance. Uh, we have to uh, we have to think about uh, where the money is going to go, etc. But if because you know it's very rare to see in front of you a new taxation in all the world. It's once a century, once two centuries. You are going to have this financial crisis. I am sure of that. When I saw that Nicolas Sarkozy did that, I can tell you that a lot of people are going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it's like that. It's for money. And it will be the same in the US. I discussed with Clinton and Hillary Clinton, and she said, yes, we are going to do that for money. But we have to explain with the public opinion that it's a shame to not give a part to the court. So it's a conflict. And I am sure that Norway will be beside us with this uh, um, I come back, I come back to, yes, I, I agree with you. If we succeed, uh, for example, with the financial transaction tax or uh, um, we are going to have not uh, 2 billion in five years, but we are going to have, I don't know, but, uh, probably 50 billion. If you have 50 billion, I agree with you, we have to, my point of view is to take five pilot countries, developing countries in the world. In Africa, with the agreement of the head of state or the prime minister of these countries, and to say how we can build a new health system. Not to copy, copy uh, uh, our system in Western countries, because when I see some big hospital in uh, uh, West Africa, uh, it's terrible to see that, because with the price, the cost, of one big hospital, you can treat millions and millions of people. And so we have to create a new health system in developing countries. And uh, yes, I'm sure that uh, what is important in the healthcare uh, system, it is a system, it's not drugs, medicines, or vaccines. They agree with you. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, on that note, I think we would thank. Oh, Desmond, you want a very quick comment? Yeah. I, I think that this issue can be determined by political and ethical considerations, not reason arguments. However, I think that reason arguments matter, and I think Ula, when you very to of the philosophical side, I think it's more than the philosophical side. I think that you need coherent argument as well as a very powerful political and ethical argument. So I will make a clean break. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, all of you.
and especially the four panelists, and of course, in particular, Dr. Philip Lossi, for coming to Newby and for giving this presentation. Thank you, everybody.